Near this house at 4th and Grove, there's an intersection. I, I encounter it every day, and for 20 years now, I've stood there pushing the little crosswalk to signal button. And after pushing it, I stand there and stand there and stand there, waiting for the light to change. And the longer I wait, the more I push the button. Over time, I've tried variations, pushing it in a syncopated rhythm, uh, pushing it at a certain amount of times, 7, 13, 29. Sometimes I thought it was dependent on the time of day or season or some complex citywide pattern known to only a select few. But through it all, for, for years now, I've stood there trusting in some invisible traffic signal logic. Until today. Today, I brought a crowbar. And after I removed it from the post, I unscrewed the plate in back and I looked inside. Nothing. Not a single wire. Just a lone button attached to nothing but the finger of a stupid pedestrian filled with hope and trust. I thought you should know this, and I take great pleasure in what I'm about to say. I knew it. All the years, all the times I stood out there and pushed that button until my finger ached, I knew it! We demand the illusion of involvement. Just give us a button, that's all we ask, because as long as we have a button to push, we assume that we're making things happen. But the truth is, the light changes when it wants to. We have nothing to do with it. I'm not the kind of guy that spends hundreds on a last minute flight to New York, tears across town, and runs up six flights of stairs to knock on my best friend's girlfriend's door in order to run off and elope with her based on one crazy, thoughtless, inexplicably romantic night. So what am I doing here, Audrey? I'm not passionate. I'm a fact checker for Christ's sake. Soulmates? How can I be yours? You barely know me and I barely know you. Now your boyfriend, I've known him since kindergarten. Am I really willing to throw all of these years of friendship away based on what? Some feeling that says I must be with you or I'll die? That only happens in the movies. But we're not in the movies. We are on McDougal Street, two blocks south of Bleecker. That's where we are. That is an indisputable geographical fact. And all the facts are pointing to one thing. We cannot do this. Because the fact is you're in a relationship. Because the fact is I just met you yesterday. Because the fact is I'm not the kind of man that falls in love. That's a fact. But you see the problem. The problem is despite every fact I can muster. I still love you madly. And it just defies all reason. But I love you madly. And I don't want to. But I can't help it. Finally, the day of reckoning had come. Robert Baratheon marched on the city after his victory at Trident. But my father got there first, with the entire Lannister army at his back, promising to defend the city against the rebels. But I knew my father better than that. He was never one to choose the losing side. I told the Mad King that much. I urged him to surrender peacefully. But he didn't listen to me. And he didn't listen to Varys who tried to warn him. But he did listen to Grand Meister Pycelle. That grey sunken cunt. You can trust the Lannisters, he said. The Lannisters have always been friends of the Crown. So we opened the gates and my father sacked the city. Once again I came to the king. I pleaded with him to 
surrender. He told me to bring him my father's head. Then he turned to his pyromancer. Burn them all, he said. Burn them all in their homes. Burn them all in their beds. Tell me, if your precious Renly had commanded you to kill your father and then stand by as thousands of men, women and children burned alive, would you have done it? Would you have kept your oath then? First I killed the pyromancer. And then, as the king turned to flee, I drove my sword into his back. Burn them all, he kept saying. Burn them all. I don't think he expected to die. I think he meant to burn with the rest of us. And rise again, reborn a dragon. To turn his enemies into ash. And that's when I slit his throat. To make sure that didn't happen. And that's when Ned Stark found me. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by the sun of York. And all the clouds that are upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean laid. Buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths. Our stunner autumns changed to merry meetings. Our bruised arms hung up for monuments, grim-visaged war has smoothed its wrinkled front. And now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasings of a lute. I, that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking glass, I, that am so rudely stamped and want love's majesty to strut before an untumwumbling nymph, Cheated a feature by dissembling nature. Deformed. Unfinished. Sent before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up, and that so lamely and unfashionable that even the dogs bark at me as I halt by them. Why, I, in this weak piping time of peace, have no delight in pass away the time. So let's uh, spy my own shadow in the sun and descant on my own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well spoken days. I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Can you? Can you wipe out that much red? Dracoff's daughter, Sao Paulo, the hospital fire. Oh, Barton told me everything. Your ledger is dripping. It's gushing red. And you think saving a man no more virtuous than yourself will change anything? This is the basic sentimentality. This is a, this is a child at prayer. Oh, perfect.
pathetic. You lie and kill in the service of liars and killers. You pretend to be separate, to have your own code. Some think that will make up for the horrors. Well, they're a part of you, and they will never go away. I won't touch Barton. No, not until I make him kill you. Slowly, intimately, in every way he knows you fear, and then he'll wake up. He'll wake up just long enough to see his good work, and when he screams I'll split his skull. This is my bargain, you mewling quim. You're a monster. Oh no. You brought the monster. I was thinking about a story from the Bible. I'm not a religious man, but I've read bits and pieces over the years, curiosity more than faith. In this one story, there was a, a man, he was traveling from Jericho to Jerusalem when he was set upon by men of ill intent. They stripped the traveler of his clothes, they beat him, and they left him bleeding in the dirt. A priest happened by, saw the traveler, and crossed to the other side of the road and continued on. Next day, Levite, a uh, religious functionary, came to the place, saw the dying traveler, but he too crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. But then came a man from Samaria, a Samaritan, a good man. He saw the traveler bleeding in the road and stopped to aid him without thinking about the circumstances or, or the difficulty it might bring him. He tended to the traveler's wounds, applying oil and wine. He carried him to an inn and gave him all the money he had for the manager to take care of the traveler. He did this simply because the man was his neighbor. He loved his city and all the people in it. I always thought I was the Samaritan in that story. It's funny, isn't it, how even the best of men are deceived by their own true nature? I am not the Samaritan. I am not the priest or the, or the Levite. I am the ill intent who set upon the traveler on a road he should not have been on. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Mr. Paulson has told you that the testimony of Sir Tobias is nothing. Sarah Tobias was raped, but that's nothing. She was cut, bruised, terrorized, and that is nothing. All of it happened in front of a howling crowd, and that's nothing. Well, it may be nothing to Mr. Paulson, but it is not nothing to Sarah Tobias, and I don't believe that it is nothing to you. Next, Mr. Paulson tried to convince you that Kenneth Joyce was the only person in that room who knew that Sarah Tobias was being raped. The only one. Now you saw Kenneth Joyce. How did he strike you? Did he seem especially sensitive? Especially observant? Did he seem so remarkable? that you immediately said to yourselves, of course this man would notice things that other people wouldn't. Do you believe that Kenneth Joyce saw something that those three men didn't see? The whole time that Sarah Tobias was being held down on that pinball machine the others didn't know, Kenneth Joyce confessed to you that he watched a rape and did nothing. He told you everyone in that bar behaved badly. He was right. But no matter how immoral it may be, it is not the crime of criminal solicitation to walk away from a rape. 
It is not the crime of criminal solicitation to silently watch a rape. But it is the crime of criminal solicitation to induce, to encourage, to entreat, to persuade another person to commit a rape. Hold her down. Stick it to her. Make her moan. These three men did worse than nothing. They cheered and they clapped and they rooted the others on, made sure Sarah Tobias was raped and raped and raped. Now, tell me, is that nothing?